Computer hacker group Anonymous is claiming tonight that it took down the website of the Federal Appeals Court in San Francisco this afternoon. They took down Senate.gov servers, they've taken down HB Gary, Sony's claiming they did $150 million worth of damage. So many confidential files that tonight, because of these hackers, can be in the hands of anyone. Visa, MasterCard, the PayPal situation. The criminals who hacked into Sarah Palin's private email. The Church of Scientology says Anonymous is a cyber terrorist group of religious bigots. Anonymous and this other group called a Lulz Sec. They seem to be wanting to prove a point. Anonymous kind of was like the big strong buff kid who had low self-esteem. And then all of a sudden punched somebody in the face and was like, holy shit, I'm really strong. And Anonymous calls itself the final boss of the internet. And sometimes it proves to be really fucking true. You are going to violate the freedoms of the internet, you certainly better watch the fuck out. They are kind of the rude boys of activism. There's a real rough edge to them, which I think also is one reason why they garner so much love and hate from people too. They represent a certain sort of chaotic freedom individual, young, nameless, faceless folks are having geopolitical impact. I mean, it's, it's, it's both exhilarating to realize that and terrifying to realize that. It kind of depends on how that power is wielded. We are legion. We do not forget. Expect us. We stand for freedom, we stand for freedom of speech, the power of the people, the ability for them to protest against the government, to right wrongs, no censorship, especially online, but also in real life. We have members throughout society and all stratas of it worldwide. Yeah, we have no leadership. It's a one voice, it's, it's not individual voices. That's why we don't show our faces, that's why we don't give our names. We're speaking as one, and it's a collective. Good timing. I would love to live in a country where the government fears its citizens and not, and, and not the other way around. But right now, plenty of anonymous actors are in hiding because of fear of reprisals by the government. I've been called many things. There's unpatriotic. That we're just a bunch of children sitting in some, our parents' basement. I got called a terrorist sympathizer. We've been called kids, we've been called cyber bullies, we've been called hooligans, and you know, sometimes those words aren't entirely unfair, but this is a serious political movement. No one, you know, in the general public really seems to get it. What they don't seem to get is that the ability for Anonymous to be everything and anything is, is, is its power. Anonymous is a series of relationships. Hundreds and hundreds of people uh, who are very active in it and who have varying skill sets and who have varying issues they want to advance and uh, who are collaborating in different ways each day. They're a little bit like a prism or a kaleidoscope. They've got many different facets and many different sides. Of course, when you spend enough time with them, you start to get a sort of feel or texture um, that's not just random, right? Yet it's very multifaceted, very rich, does, which does span from the quite lighthearted to the very, very serious. Bob Dylan had a line in a song to saying, to live outside the law, you must be honest. They might do something which isn't technically correct, maybe it's not legally correct, but they're doing it for purposes that in their minds at least are ethical. People who know what they're doing, who share an ethos, who have a commitment to exposing and humiliating the man, who have a very low tolerance of um, lies and uh, what they perceive as uh, evil on the part of overweening power structures. They share information, they share tools and techniques, and they uh, are currently having a very good time. The hacker culture, as we know it, 
uh, really sprang from one place. It, it was MIT, and it was uh, uh, specifically the people in the uh, Model Railroad Club, the Tech Model Railroad Club. Hacking originated as humorous pranks. When the guys at MIT put a Volkswagen up on top of the dome of the building, uh, and people woke up and saw the car up there in the morning, uh, or they uh, measured a bridge by the body lengths of somebody, I would say his name was Brian, and discovered the bridge over the Charles River was, you know, 822 Brian's. Uh, these are funny things. That's where hacking originated, and it migrated into engineering and uh, computer communities. Uh, it's witty, it's pranks. I'm Chris Weisopel, former member of The Loft. We don't necessarily say hacking group because it makes it sound like we're hacking, so we used to call it a hacker's think tank. Hacktivism was a term coined by a group called Cult of the Dead Cow. The Cult of the Dead Cow was really kind of um, a, sort of like a propaganda type of organization. They had a guy who was the minister, minister of propaganda. They're kind of merry pranksters. Like everything they did was completely over the top. One of the guys there coined the term hacktivism because he saw what his, one of the things his group was doing, which he called hacktivism, was writing software that people in other countries could use to communicate securely, even if their government was spying on them. So the principle was really, it was freedom of expression. It was everyone should have access to the internet. Everyone should be able to communicate and get their message out on the internet. Even more important in countries where there was repressive regimes, that if you said something against the regime, they would come and take you away and you weren't saying it anymore. Just like in, you know, in, act, in traditional activism, it spans the full gamut from sit-ins or, or, or pickets to actually spiking trees and pouring sand in you know, the engines of construction vehicles. I mean, there's real sabotage. The same thing does all fall under the, the hacktivism label. There is a spectrum. There's sometimes a strong anarchist uh, flavor to it as well. Uh, it's resistance to authority and those who would impose groupthink and group behavior uh, on people, which uh, was rightly perceived to be a, a consequence of the digital revolution as it was used by people in power to do hacking on behalf of righteousness and to redress the grievances of the world. Lance lowered Don Quixote on his horse, uh, nag though she was, uh, flying at, at the windmills of, of uh, modern life. Anonymous grew out of what's known as 4chan. Essentially, this is just a, a website where people can upload images uh, and you don't actually give your name. It's just sort of anonymous. When you look at 4chan, you're often surprised because it looks like a site from like 1995 or something. Um, the idea is very simple. You post a comment and you post a picture. Um, and you can post under your name or, or anonymously. And it's separated into boards about particular topics. So there's a topic on anime, there's a topic on uh, weaponry. There's like a 4chan board for origami and you just upload interesting pictures of origami. And then there was a, a group called or B, the B board, which essentially was for like anything goes. The first time anybody goes on B, it's kind of an instant revulsion. Because uh, there's never a time that you go on there where you don't see something horrible. That instantly puts off a lot of people. The idea is post something that can never be unseen. Half of the posts on B are there specifically to make people not want to come back to B. It's what you get when people are allowed to express themselves with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. It's the kind of sum of human imagination and people can get together and think together without any limits or parameters. It's the most vile, disgusting, and funny thing uh, on the internet. One of the important things about 4chan is to have a thread that really explodes and lasts for a long time. If it doesn't, then it disappears. It's a site that's not archived. So it creates conditions for anything that grabs attention at some level. And so humor and grotesqueness as a result are quite good for that. I'd rather just be referred to as anonymous, I guess, in, in the interviews, because I have some docs out on me. Fortune's just where I went to. I grew up on it and I, I lived there. That's just what I did for fun. It takes a thick skin to enjoy it. 
But, you know, as long as you're not offended, you'll occasionally come into something really cool or really creative on 4chan. I think the most interesting thing about it is how you can watch memes evolve. You'll see something posted one day, and then a week later, it's got 50,000 derivatives of it. A meme is basically just an idea. It's kind of like a gene, but in the realm of the idea. A lot of the, the great internet memes that, that we all know and love, you know, uh, lol cats, right? You know, little cats doing funny things, and then they have, you know, uh, I can has cheeseburger, right? All that stuff seems to start in this, like, Petri dish that is 4chan B-board. Publicly, and you're insane. Name a, any meme from the last about six years, and I'll bet you either in its first posting ever was on 4chan, or at least one of its earliest revisions that became what it was was on 4chan. I can see the food situation is so we'll be on our way. It's basically the best breeding ground for. Uh, internet culture, and as far as I'm concerned. With your neighborhood insurance rates, top net range. 4chan is also very known for acts of trolling. Trolling is a fucking art. Trolling is getting a, the person you're talking to to get as pissed off as they possibly can, and for no reason except for your own enjoyment. Maybe you're trying to illustrate a point, but it's mostly for your own enjoyment. For them, it's, it's funny that like people think the internet is serious business. And if people think the internet is serious business, it's a troll's job to make their life terrible. The idea of anonymous came initially as a joke. I mean, uh, somebody suggested that. What if the whole site, what if 4chan, what if B was just one person? And what if that's just one guy called anonymous sitting somewhere and you're just reading all these posts by one guy? And it kind of looks like that from the outsider's perspective. I mean, there's no way to tell the difference. It might as well be one guy. Fox News did a very famous segment about it. They call themselves anonymous. They are hackers on steroids, treating the web like a real-life video game, sacking websites, invading MySpace accounts, disrupting innocent people's lives. And if you fight back, watch out. Destroy. Die. Attack. Threats from a gang of computer hackers calling themselves Anonymous. I've had seven different passwords and they've got them all so far. Anonymous hacked his site and plastered it with gay sex pictures. His girlfriend left him. She thought that, that I was cheating on her with guys. As long as I can think back, Anonymous have done some pretty off-color things in the name of getting cheap laughs, you know. But, I mean, that's part of the culture. They get what they call lulls. Lulls is a corruption of L-O-L, -L, which stands for laugh out loud. Anonymous gets big lulls from pulling random pranks. For example, messing with online children's games like Habbo Hotel. Habbo Hotel was this online community where you had an avatar and you walked around and talked to other people. It was kind of like an early version of you know world of warcraft or second life or any of those virtual worlds what the the people on b did was invade have a hotel created you know thousands of avatars they they all had this one uniform of a black guy with a big afro wearing a black suit and so they there would be thousands of these people black guys black suit you know huge afro walking around this world and they would do things like form a swastika out of themselves and I think that was a real landmark because it, it was when they were able to see that, you know, they can use their numbers to do something really interesting and really disruptive. So we blocked the entrance to their pool and that just pissed them off so fucking much. It was fucking beautiful. That was fucking just wonderful, wonderful times. Those kids love that pool. They love the shit out of their pool. The goal was actually to offend everyone, uh, simply because the idea that we could offend you by drawing a little shape on the screen was, was stupid to the people involved in it. They were like, really, you're going to get that mad over us doing, just drawing this on the screen? Wow, well, you, you need to refocus a little on life because this should not be upsetting you that much. All these different organizations online, whether it's 4chan 
or just any, any website, there's typically a community uh, aspect to it. This is where people have their social uh, relationships. This is where their friends are. This is where they have a creative outlet. And so all those aspects are going into groups like Anonymous, where people feel like they're part of a bigger thing and they're able to express themselves within that group. There were certain, uh, certain words, certain phrases, uh, certain ways people respond to things, certain images that are posted that created a pattern. And that pattern was, I guess, the origin of what is now anonymous. It's like Freemasons with a sense of humor. And so much as they have this common symbology and, and one of their chief joys, which is kind of wrapped up in power and secrecy, was the fact that they could recognize each other by referencing these symbols, referencing these phrases. Over 9,000. It's over 9,000! I lost my iPod, mudkips, anything involving mudkips. So you have this weird sort of international culture developing with people you know, across the world, wherever they may be. In late 06 and you know, into early 07, there's a bit of a sea change where instead of just posting a bunch of content or randomly saying we're going to go over to some website and post a bunch of dirty comments against someone, uh, it becomes a little more organized. Welcome to the Hal Turner Show. They went after a guy named Hal Turner. I am being discriminated against because I'm white. Hal Turner was a, a neo-Nazi who was, you know, big online and had a, like a podcast. I think that the 14th Amendment was not ratified properly, and I think, therefore, it is still okay to have Negroes as slaves in America. The first time I heard about Hal Turner is he was knocking somebody on 4chan. There's a million neo-Nazis out there. But he started picking on our dudes, so we had to go to our dudes fucking defense, and it just so happened that he was a neo-Nazi, so that's a big reason that he's a fucking dick face. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hola, this is Pedro. Spick, from don't San call Diego. He was just a horribly racist radio personality who seemed to handle it well when you called in, like he could handle being berated by Anonymous. And that made it very interesting. It made it a bit of a challenge. It wasn't some guy who just either crumbled or stopped answering the phone. It was a guy who would yell back. Hal Turner wasn't the first like actual person that you know, Anonymous had caused trouble for, but the circumstances ended up being significant. They DDoSed his, his website, stuff like that, costing him thousands of dollars, bandwidth fees. Denial of service has been around for a long, long time. The equivalent of like, if you, you know, for some reason wanted to disrupt a, a bus service, right? You can hire a thousand extras to all go and like line up at the bus station, right? And get on the bus. And so then anyone who was really trying to get on the bus couldn't do it, right? It's as simple as that. When you stop trying to visit, website goes back up, no permanent damage. We did Austin and then we kind of trolled him in real life. We sent countless pizzas to his house. We signed him up for escorts on Craigslist. We sent a bunch of pallets of uh, you know, industrial materials to his house, which he ultimately had to put the bill for. And basically we destroyed his ability to pay for his radio show and that took him off the internet. And then they ended up getting some, some real hackers to, to help them out. Like this wasn't sort of pranks, they actually like were able to get into Hal Turner's private servers uh, and his mail servers and you know, find some interesting emails that he was serving as an FBI informant, uh, which you know, if you're a, you know, a right-wing neo-Nazi, is not a good thing to be. And obviously him being an FBI informant and also his reaction, his sort of douchebaggy reaction to the raids uh, damaged his credibility within the white nationalist scene, you know, which is a shame. Hal Turner's gone, he's been prosecuted by the feds for threatening judges. What follows is a period of, of confusion and, and anger in which you know, the original anonymous people of the sort who want to keep anonymous as this nihilist little, you know, ridiculous group, you know, are upset that now, you know, that the most terrible thing on the internet is now becoming a force for good all of a sudden. I'm Mike Vitale, and my handle is Seth Dude. Now, this is January 2008. Anonymous is strong now. You know, we're not a little dinky fucking group anymore. Like, this is like millions of people worldwide and we're watching. And then Scientology stepped in with a big target on its chest. A video came out of Tom Cruise that was supposed to be like an internal Scientology video uh, talking about secrets of, of Scientology. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. 
As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. It talks about you're the only one who can stop you know, bad things from happening. Uh, and so this is kind of widely mocked online. It circulated like wildfire. Instantly, the Scientologists uh, post uh, a DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And this is a way that if you own content, you can go to video sites, uh, upload sites, and have your content pulled when someone uploads it illegally. So Scientology is always at odds with the internet, always trying to legally bully people out of fucking them over on the internet. They always did that. Um, and then here they are trying again, but you know what? Anonymous saw that and they said, oh, you guys just fucked around badly. Like you're trying to censor our internet. You know, like are you trying to take a joke away from Anonymous? Like you don't do that. A few Anons, a few people on 4chan posted, hey, we should grab that video and post it on a few other sites. What followed was uh, this is a term called the Barbra Streisand effect. And this video, as they're attempting to suppress it, went everywhere. Like, everywhere you look on the internet, you were gonna stumble upon this video. Actually, Gawker, the site that I worked for, was, I think, the first one to put it on the website, and we got in a huge legal battle with Scientology, who wanted us to take it down. Scientology is an interesting target because in some ways it's the perfect inversion of what geeks and hackers value. At so many different levels, science fiction, intellectual property, discourses of freedom, science and technology, it's very proprietary, it's closed. And so in some ways, if you had something like a cultural inversion machine and you stuck geeks and hackers in there, you'd get something that looks a lot like Scientology. So it's quite offensive and there's a real pleasure in attacking your perfect nemesis. And people who knew what Anonymous was to begin with were like, oh my God, Anonymous is gonna go to war with Scientology. This should be really interesting. Especially because it's two weird ass groups. I mean, I, you know, I've been an Anon for a long fucking time. I know Anonymous is really strange. They're re like, they're weird, and the stuff we like is weird, and it's really not mainstream at all. Now you have Scientology. Also really weird, a lot of crazy shit goes down. Anybody on the outside who's seen this is going, let's watch these two retards fight. Like, a, they're, both their pants are gonna fall down, they're gonna triple, and then it's gonna hurt everybody, and it's gonna be hysterical. And then that's when 4chan kind of reared into action, really reared into action. And they started to troll the Church of Scientology. And this took the form of pranking the Dianetics hotline, ordering pizzas. I go to call them on the phone and it's busy, busy, busy. You know, and that's their main fucking Dianetics hotline. Their Dianetics 800 number, you can't get through because the nons have completely fucking clogged it and just probably saying stupid shit. The whole idea was just you call them just to keep them on the phone. What's an L Ron? How do I Dianetics my face? They were not expecting that and they couldn't handle it. I'm Brian Mettenbrink. I had just gone to the 4chan just on pure happenstance, and I saw a post about the Scientology thing, and I started looking up stuff, and I'm like, oh, this is actually for a decent cause. I think I'll, you know, do this. Anonymous members have, have developed a distributed denial of service attack tool called Low Orbit Ion Cannon, which is a name taken from a computer game. Low Orbit Ion Cannon is what's called an end game weapon in um, Red Alert. All you had to do was literally follow instructions step by step. You do it, you put it in the site, you see that the IP is correct, you make sure that all these settings are good and you hit the button and off it goes. And what it does is it tells Scientology.org in this case, it tells them to send their website to my computer about, I think, it was 800,000 times in a weekend, and I'm pretty sure I probably took it down myself a couple of times. It felt like you were making a difference, you know, just you yourself, and you didn't even have to leave your home, you know? And one of the guys said, we need to make a video. We just, we have to make a video. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are anonymous. When the video came out on January 21st, that was one of the first times that anonymous as a um, culture started referring to itself as anonymous as a movement, that video probably changed everything. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. 
It basically looked like if a computer was going to tell you that he was going to beat the shit out of you, this is what it would look like. That one video really galvanized that moment, that moment of innovation, that that's exactly like with that video, internet activism, as it's known today, was born. And you just see this consensus forming that, that it's going to happen. So we made the code of conduct. Don't bring weapons. Dress accordingly. Cover your faces, because they will try and find out who you are and screw with your life. Rule number 17. Cover your face. This will prevent your identification from videos taken by hostiles. Scientology has a history of harassing, stalking, and just generally doing horrible things to its critics. So people needed a way to hide their identities. A lot of people had very legitimate fears. They don't want to be followed home. They don't want to be stalked. They don't want to put their families and themselves in danger. Everyone was going, well, we're going to wear a mask. What's the only fucking mask that we all already know or have a joke about? And it's the Guy Fawkes mask. You see the movie View for Vendetta, you know, the ending scene where everyone's wearing the Guy Fawkes mask. That is very reminiscent of what Anonymous thinks Anonymous is. We wanted to represent anonymity in some way when it moved into real life. I think that the Guy Fawkes mask was one of the most natural things to happen. It is the idea that none of us are as cruel as all of us. You have this massive crowd of people who are anonymous that is going to fight against a bigger thing and win. Even after watching the video, it's like, yeah, this is great, but who's actually gonna do it? Who's gonna Who's gonna step up? Are people actually gonna get out of their house? Like, the, like, and I guess we were really affected by the stereotype of of that whole community that being internet nerds, that too too afraid to leave their mom's basements. No one thought that they were gonna come out. This is me on the way there. I haven't slept. I'm very fucking tired. And I remember going to the park that day, and it's really fucking early in the morning, which I thought was a bad idea. Um, and I'm, I'm smoking a cigarette, and I'm looking around like, where the fuck is everybody? There's like, there's nobody here. So here I am, sitting in Bryant Park. Waiting for the other announcers to show up. I remember thinking like, oh fuck, like, am I gonna be the only one in the park? Am I gonna walk to Scientology with fucking six or seven people? Which totally defeats the entire purpose of this because now they could single me out, you know? Then I, I get up and I start walking around and I see there's a lot of green balloons over there for some reason on the other side of the park there was like fucking 200 people there was guy fox masks everywhere and i'm like holy shit this is huge there's a, a fucking lot of us that's pretty good i had no idea how many anons there were until we started moving and it just fucking got bigger i remember walking through times square and Everybody in Times Square was in a knot. Like, and you know, this is like a fucking thousand person per like fucking minute foot traffic area. And everywhere I'm looking, I'm seeing fucking Anon symbols. It, it was fucking wild. It was really wild. So we start getting numbers in, and Sydney. We're thinking that it's going to be 50 people. And before 10 a.m., before even time, there's already 50 people there, and there's still streams of people walking down the streets. A couple hours into it, you know, because I didn't go to bed until one in the morning, you know, you're looking at Sydney as, uh, wow, there's 250 people in Sydney. The cops are estimating higher than that um, for their reports. What, what just happened? Adelaide, Perth, and Melbourne happen. And, you know, over 200 at each of them. We, we nearly broke a thousand leaving Australia. Now, the next protest was Tel Aviv, which had actually gotten its first Scientology building right before this. There were Palestinians and Israelis at this protest, both holding their flags. And at one point, they actually switched flags and held up each other's flags and whatnot. It was awesome to see. I call our guy in London, uh, Britannon, and I say, hey, uh, what's going on there? And he's like, did you just get out of bed? I said, yeah, I haven't even turned on the computer. I just figured I'd call you. And he said, we've got 600 people and the cops are really, really mad at me. All the major cities were having hundreds of people come out. It's massive. Clearwater had like 300 people. 
I don't think anyone beat out LA. I think LA had over a thousand people. We are Legion! We are Legion! The thing that happened was something completely different and hundreds and hundreds of people from every city just swarmed the streets. It was kind of overwhelming, a little even scary, but scary in a good way. Soon, you know, we're at around the 10,000 mark, you know, and we were joking the whole time over 9,000, you know, one of those memes. It was too surreal. It was not believable. You go by what name? We are anonymous. It was very empowering, especially after people saw the thousands of people showing up. This was it. We owned the world at that point. We all met each other. The idea of an Anon is you're fucking alone until you get to 4chan, you know, and then these people all think like you, you know. Then all of a sudden you're not alone. Um, you are with fucking 500 others, you know. They all know the same jokes as you. Um, they all have, clearly, have similar interests as you. Here's your culture. <laughs> you meet your own people, finally. perhaps a little surprising. It's not just preteens or teenagers. There's a, f a far more even mix of males and females than you would imagine otherwise. And you know, there were a lot of, a lot of, you know, these so-called, you know, guys who weren't socially good. They were very awkward. They, they still lived at home at 23, half of them virgins. And I'll tell you the amount of those people who got laid from these protests happening is in the thousands that would not have uh, for years probably. And that's why those protests were so important. It was a chance to finally meet other people that were previously anonymous and unknown, and hence it was the moment of the end of their anonymity. Scientology, they kind of fought back, so to speak. They posted stuff online. While claiming they are peaceful, in less than three weeks, anonymous members made or encouraged 8,139 harassing or threatening phone calls, 3.6 million malicious emails, 141 million hits against church websites, 10 acts of vandalism, 22 bomb threats, and 8 death threats against members and officials of the Church of Scientology. They wanted to find me. Um, they did. They hired PIs. They started taking pictures of us, threatening to sue us. I did the whole low orbit ion cannon stuff, and then I pretty much just went about my life after that for, see, I think it's six months, and then they, the FBI showed up here at my parents' house. Two men got out of the car and took their, their jackets, guns. took their jackets off and laid their guns on the front seat and um, came up to ask us if Brian was home and um, explained that they were the FBI and they were looking for Brian and I've never been so scared. I did the second most damage is what Scientology said. I did, I sent the second most out of everybody. So I got the maximum for my category, which was one year in prison and one year supervised release. I think, you know, the way I feel is for what I did was one of the most like lopsided punishments I've ever like read about or heard of. Yeah, I think it's uh, ridiculous, especially the the year supervised release where I can't touch a computer for a year. I'm not sure what that's supposed to solve except make my life, life difficult. So that computer behind me back there, I, I could go back to prison if I went over and touched it. I'm very proud of what he did. He stood up for what he believed in. I never would even dream of hurting anybody, you know. It's just not me. Prior to Anonymous, critics of the church still had to be very, very careful because of the aggressive lawsuits that were launched against academics, journalists, and other critics. I would say that era is over, and Anonymous more than any other sort of intervention is probably responsible for that change. This actually caused a decent rift in Anonymous. There was one big group, significant group of people who would say, this chinology stuff, it's, it's cancer, it's awful, it's bad, it's, it's just bringing attention to us that we don't want. One Anon said it well once, 
There is no leader. Their ops have momentary leaders, de facto leaders. It, almost through meritocracy, there's more respected or more persistent participants. Some people participate in a single operation and are never heard from again. It might even be a housewife who just, you know, agrees with that political statement or that protest. I like to describe this with the picture of a bird swarm. Everybody's flying very, very quiet. Suddenly, one bird flies into the other direction and the mass fly into the same direction following that person. It's totally okay to say, I'm sorry, I don't take part. When Shonology was running full force, it was like a kid stretching for the first time and actually seeing the real power. If you had asked me all throughout 2008 and most of 2009, is the politics of Anonymous always going to be sutured and hinged to the Church of Scientology? I would have said yes. And it became unsutured, unhinged, when a different political wing was born in 2010. It is our task to find secret abusive plans and expose them where they can be opposed before they're implemented. The interesting thing about someone like Assange is that he actually also sprang from you know, a, a, a hacker culture. It's a mentality of spreading information. Julian was Mendax. He was the greatest hacker that ever walked the face of the Earth when I was a kid. I mean, they, they rumored he could move satellites around in space by hacking into NASA. I mean, I mean, you know, it probably, maybe it never happened, but I mean, it was, you know, it was a myth that kept young kids like me wanting to, like, you know, plug a computer into a modem and see if I can move some satellites around. WikiLeaks is an instantiation of the hacker ethos. Truth wants to be free, and we want to liberate it. WikiLeaks release a huge trove of diplomatic cables. There was a lot of controversy from every quarter of society. The WikiLeaks website released nearly 400,000 secret U.S. files on the Iraq war late today. It was the largest leak of classified U.S. files in history. There was one particular moment that really sparked the fire, and this was when PayPal, MasterCard, and Amazon pulled services for WikiLeaks. So all of a sudden, there's no way to actually like process donations to, to WikiLeaks. And then people went and found like neo-Nazi groups. Visa and MasterCard were perfectly fine with you being able to like, you know, PayPal being able to like make donations to them. But WikiLeaks, no. I think WikiLeaks is doing a good thing. It's just a total hypocrisy. They, they got the little fucking banking mafia to fuck, you know, WikiLeaks over. People were incredibly angry. And it was a, a real sense of rage. Anonymous dosed PayPal. They were pissed. The numbers of participants were massive. Massive. And they manage over the course of a couple of days to disable the websites of MasterCard and PayPal. It was beautiful. Because what you had is people finally stood up for something. My name's Pete Fine. You can call me an internaut or a hacktivist. Telecomics is an ad hoc cluster of volunteer net activists um, who have spent much of the last year trying to keep the internet running in the Middle East. In kind of the lead up to the Egyptian revolution, we would tweet on people's behalf. We would get people from Egypt who were unable to access Twitter on their own on our IRC network. And we would take reports from them and tweet them out using, using our account to kind of help them get the word out about what they were experiencing. Some of this shit is personal. And one of the things about the movement as a whole, when Egypt rolled around, is that Egypt broke us emotionally. Watching in real time with live feeds that we helped set up, Egyptians get massacred with machine guns. It was different, and I have never in cyber activism wept before. It's never bothered me like that. It's never been able to touch me the way Egypt touched me. And then January 27th, January 28th rolls around, and the Egyptian government starts shutting down the internet. I mean, just, just for the whole country, the whole country. There's this fantastic 
traffic graph that you can see the traffic coming out of Egypt and it looks like, you know, like this. And it goes like that. Just totally stops. And we were just shocked. I mean, we were just like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? To think that a country would completely cut itself off as much as it was able to from the outside world was pretty unthinkable. You know, we know, we know bad things go on in the dark places. That's the kind of thing that could start riots. I think when Mubarak did what he did, I think it really upset people here uh, as well as in the Middle East. I put myself in their place and I, I, I found myself in a desert of nothingness because he just wiped out everything that my world incorporated. That just showed me and everybody else that the same thing can happen at any time, at anywhere, in any government. Anonymous and the people on the internet stood up and said, go fuck yourself. You want to shut down their internet? Fine. The people on the internet will show them how to turn it back on. A lot of my friends helped with encryption, helped people on the ground in those countries validate SSL keys and certificates, and really showed them how to subvert their government and, and become free. And then telecomics started to tweet connections to the internet, dial-up connections. In Egypt, the care package we put together included some kind of our comms information, the ham radio and dial modem. Uh, details. In total, we helped coordinate and run about 500 dial-up modem lines. We also Googled up treatments for tear gas and other kind of basic medical treatment and found folks who could translate that into Arabic. Sort of put this together in a nice one-page PDF and fax and off it goes. President Hosni Mubarak has decided to step down from the office of President of the Republic. When Mubarak left, it was a hell yeah moment. People can rise up, people can make a change. And I think for, for a lot of people in America, it was the first time they had seen people rise up and take down their government and say, we're sick of this shit. We're sick of the oppression. We're sick of living as slaves to your power. We had Egyptians come thank us as we're doing this stuff. And I said to them, like, look, you guys just get our back if stuff goes down here. It's a revolution that was facilitated by, by the internet, uh, by Facebook and, and by Twitter. Not caused by it. I mean, 50 years of dictatorship has caused, caused the Arab Spring. Uh, but the internet has certainly been helping. Although it was awesome and it was one part we were fighting for, for me it was quite clear that it's not the end of the story. That it's not uh, suddenly changing into rainbows and nine cats or whatever. But that we now have to watch even more. Suddenly on February 5th, Financial Times article comes out, they'll be all see. It's quoting this guy named Aaron Barr, who's the, who's the CEO of HP Gary Federal, which is an intelligence contractor. And Aaron Barr is telling his Financial Times journalist, Joseph Men, that he's been secretly monitoring the Anonop server where all this is going on, and has done so for several weeks, and using his own custom brand of information operations techniques, has managed to identify the alleged leadership of Anonymous, including 25, quote, lieutenants, unquote, some sort. We have to see this document. Everyone wants to know. We don't need to destroy him. We don't need to destroy his company. So they get it. it. It was unbelievably easy to get into that network. Now, to put that in hacker terms, Anonymous is a hornet's nest. And Barr said, I'm going to stick my penis in that thing. <laughs> the H.B. Gary hack brought about 70,000 emails. Probably the most important ones had to do with a proposal that H.P. Gary had already formulated. It was packaged up as a nice PowerPoint presentation. Kind of act as privatized agent provocateurs, where they were going to discredit WikiLeaks. H.P. Gary was proposing submitting fake documents to WikiLeaks, and then when discovered as fake, the error could be called out and right. it would discredit WikiLeaks. Right. 
So, um, so there's a lot of like specifics that I can't talk, but so let me try to answer that though in a, in a in a general sense. Um, well, first of all, I'm it's probably no surprise to anybody. I'm not a big fan of WikiLeaks. I think that uh, the broad um, purpose of trying to get as much information, proprietary or classified information for the government, and expose that is an extremely destructive and dangerous purpose. The proposals involve conducting information war uh, on WikiLeaks and its supporters, creating dissension within WikiLeaks, um, DDoS attacks. You, you also wanted to launch cyber attacks on WikiLeaks infrastructure to get information on document submitters. Well, one thing I guess I want to make sure is, is clear is, um, you know, n none of those activities had actually occurred. You know, there's in business, there's, um, you know, when you when you start proposing or thinking about an idea, there's a brainstorming phase. And somebody says, well, what if, you know, what could we do? What's theoretically possible? Well, still, this was an idea. This was proposed. This was something that you thought about. Right. They also wanted to go on a campaign kind of targeting Glenn Greenwald, who's a reporter for Salon, who's an outspoken kind of critic of the government and supporter of WikiLeaks. It seems like you're trying to attack a journalist here. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to talk too much more about Glenn Greenwald, but other than, you know, what I previously said is, it, you know, the, there was never an intent to attack uh, uh, journalists. Um, not on my part. You know, I, you know, nor, I guess I should say, gen, I should generalize that and to say that, you know, I, I would never just outwardly attack a journalist, other than if I felt that there was a journalist in my mind that was acting uh, unethically, that, you know, that is... That's a um, fair game for having a public discussion about. They were walking a very fine ethical line at points. And in many cases, the, the mass opinion is, no, they stepped well past it. I will not support broad theft of, of, of information released to the public, because that's nothing but destructive. If somebody has information that's been stolen from them, and um, you know whether or not you know WikiLeaks encouraged the theft of that, or or whether or not it was just put in their lap, still they're they're threatening to release the information that is the private property of another organization. So um, the, your choices are to just allow that to happen, or to try to stop it. How offensive is too offensive? You know, we've certainly seen a lot of strategy coming out of governments across the world now saying, you know, based, publicly admitting that they need to become, they need to develop better offensive strategies uh, in cybersecurity because defense in, in, as, as a whole it isn't enough. It, it never is enough. In the court of public opinion, that took H.B. Geary quickly from being a perceived victim to being a perceived villain themselves. It was becoming harder and harder to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. And then kind of seemingly out of the blue. There was something by the name Lulsec that sailed into the seas. Lulsec, it's a sort of a, a group, mostly from Anonymous, who, large part were the same people who hacked H.P. Gary. And they decided to form this little group and uh, just carry on uh, operations sort of outside of the purview of Anonymous for a while. They hacked whatever they wanted, they released whatever they wanted. It's almost like they had no rules, they just said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stir up the court. We're going to make some trouble. We're going to make some waves. And they did. The majority of time, the majority of Anons are not doing anything particularly illegal. When they are, a huge number of them try to do that in a very specific political context. For those people, uh, what Lulsec was doing, they were funny, but they were attacking random targets. They were breaking the quasi rules by attacking media. PBS's Frontline runs a documentary mainly focused on Bradley Manning, the alleged leaker to WikiLeaks. And a lot of Bradley Manning supporters didn't like it. They hacked a website putting a story that Tupac and Biggie had kind of escaped the world of celebrity, fame, and attention and retired quietly and discreetly in New Zealand. Also, when they attacked PBS, um, you know, that, that, that gave me the creeps, you know. As a journalist, I'm not too thrilled with the idea of someone judging that we don't like you to write that. We don't like your reporting, so we're gonna shut down your website. I'm, un I'm uncomfortable with that. It could be me, and I could be writing something about a group that they didn't like, and 
I'm happy to, to sit and talk with them about it, but uh, you know, don't shut my website down. This is obviously about freedom of speech, so attacking the press would be uh, um, would sort of be a bit of a contradiction. Uh, so people have said, well, we shouldn't do that. Uh, and obviously, LoveSec uh, had a completely different agenda, so they had no problem with it. Activism started to become um, sort of, I would say, almost more nasty, um, using, you know, sort of more no holds barred kind of attacks, um, sort of more vicious attacks. They sort of saw themselves going out there, breaking into like, Anything, everything, governments, corporations, police departments, largely for the same reasons Anonymous would. They went after Arizona for immigration policy. 50-day run, causing mayhem, havoc, and then ended it. The computer hacking group, Lult Security, has announced it's disbanding, saying it had achieved its mission to disrupt government and corporate organizations for fun. I call this whole thing the rise of the chaotic actor. And chaotic could be chaotic good, neutral, or evil. You know, if you go back to the old Dungeons and Dragons charts. And some people see non-ops initially, and let's stick with anonymous, as chaotic good. They saw Operation Payback, or they saw attacking Scientology, and they say that's good. It's like Robin Hood, right? Chaotic good. Outside the system, but doing something good. Other people saw Anon as chaotic evil, like the Joker. They just want to see the world burn and doing potentially irreparable damage. And the truth is, yes, it's it's the entire column of chaotic. I'm, I'm actually a little less concerned about some of the things LulzSec's done and more concerned about the next generation of LulzSec, the next turn of the crank of who takes it further or, or is more aggressive. Whoever fights monsters, you know, should see to it they don't themselves become one. Really, as powerful as they seem to be, Lulsec and Anonymous are really small potatoes compared to the bigger operations that are going on that we don't hear about, maybe operations funded by government. 16 people were arrested today, but dozens of FBI agents targeted alleged members of the loose-knit hacking group. Armed with search warrants, agents hit six homes in New York, along with locations across the country. The people arrested yesterday were suspected of attacking PayPal's website after the company shut off payments to WikiLeaks. Defenders of the hackers say they're merely engaged in civil protest, but FBI officials worry the disruptive cyber attacks could move in a more dangerous direction. So the FBI shows up at 6 in the morning and it was really obnoxious. And I remember being frustrated and angry because there was nothing that I had done that would have justified an FBI search warrant. They came and uh, guns blazed and all this other good stuff, busted down the door. I immediately just dropped down on the floor, 180, didn't want nothing. I wasn't trying to fight nobody. If you, even if you accept what the government is saying is true, what is important is that people are participating in the process. It is very much the process. It is sitting in an encounter in Selma, Alabama. 500 Freedom Riders refusing to allow people to go and sit in at a segregated lunch counter. They write books about that stuff. It is demonstrating in a street corner saying no to a war. It's just a different, it's, 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 it's just a different vehicle. It's the same result. There's always gonna be legal consequence when you decide to break the law. That comes with the territory and it would be naive not to expect that. The question is whether the punishment will be proportional to the crime. And I suspect it might not be. People will be watching very closely to see how these cases proceed, on what grounds, and whether there's any room during the trials to think, especially of the denial of service attacks, as a legitimate form of protest. So much of our lives are now configured, at least in part, on the internet. So we better start thinking about how we claim parts of the internet as spaces that we can also protest in. There is a certain online culture that believes in certain values, like freedom of expression, they're against corruption, they're against governments controlling their citizens. And when they see those values harmed in some way by some organization, the hacktivists strike back. I don't think this whole issue is a technical hacking thing. This is more about 
human philosophy and psychology, what's motivating us, why is there so much unrest or disenfranchisement or anger that would lead people to want to take matters in their own hands and join these. Whether you think it's bad or not is irrelevant. It's not going away. The part of me that likes the ability to have rapid destabilization and change loves this. The part that knows how powerful it is means it's a force multiplier for good or for evil. And how that power is wielded and how we want to self-regulate is going to be the most deciding factor in if this is a menace or a benefit. I certainly don't think uh, most of the conversations in law enforcement or the government are, are informed enough to know how to deal with this. Um, I suppose the question you, you really want to ask is, would I do it again? Um, and honestly, after thinking about it, I felt that I did what was right. I have a, I had a belief, I still do, that what I did was the right thing. And hopefully someone got some good out of it. You know, I'd love to think that maybe I stopped someone from joining a cult, you know, probably wouldn't tell on myself next time. But, you know, I don't think I would have changed a single thing other than the whole talking to the FBI thing. Just that, that little yeah, detail. Yeah, just, just the little that's detail that's that kind of changed everything, yeah. I'm angry. Occasionally I have small breakdown moments of terror, <laughs> but I haven't stopped believing what I believed. I haven't stopped wanting to fight. I haven't stopped caring. Show me what democracy looks like! There's a lot of people in Anonymous who, who, who feel very deeply and very sincerely about their contribution towards democracy around the world. And I think that's, that's one of the main things that I'm most proud of about Anonymous. There are things that I'm not proud of about Anonymous, but, the, but we stand against censorship and we stand against oppressive governments, even our own. It's a very noble thing. And history teaches us that change simply doesn't come with flowers. It doesn't work. No. If they say I'm a criminal, then, well, then I will be one. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or if you like Ron Paul or if you worship pigeons or Scientology or if you're Catholic or atheist or Methodist, I don't care about that. Your opinion matters. I don't care if I disagree with it. I don't care if I hate your guts. Your opinion matters.